this work is a huge team effort and I can see several people in the room are, are helping with this. Um, uh, my uh, right hand is Dr. Ying Lu and uh, she is um, actually an MD from China and uh, that she uh, really has been running the study and originally had the first idea to do the study. Um, and I also uh, wanted to uh, point out Jackie Bainbridge um, has been extremely helpful, uh, a farm D that um, knows all the ins and outs of, uh, of, of this. And, um, but a huge team effort, um, lots of people helping. Um, the one disclosure is that uh, one study does involve the use of Epidiolex and that um, pr was provided by GW Pharmaceuticals. Um, it, they are not studying Parkinson's disease and they do not uh, promote self-directed use of cannabis. So I wanted to start with um, this patient. Um, he's 63 years old and uh, he kind of got me interested in the whole topic of uh, the use of cannabis in Parkinson's disease. Um, uh, he w climbed on the treadmill in 2012 um, and he was ready to get in the shape of his life uh, because uh, he um, uh, had been um, divorced and but he had three kids and a couple grandkids and he was an uh, IT uh, software person um, but he noticed a small shake in his left little finger um, on the treadmill and so symptoms uh, went on from there and progressed and in 2015 he was diagnosed by me with Parkinson's um, but he's done really well uh, he has mostly a tremor and he um, has no cognitive problems or balance problems and he's on minimal medication so he really has done done great um, he was talking to me one day in clinic though uh, telling me about in uh, 2000 and um, uh, just shortly after the dispensaries opened, uh, he was remembering his fun time in college uh, fondly uh, it, with cannabis and so he went down to the dispensaries and um, got a couple of strains, $50 each, bought a um, bong with a Broncos logo and uh, <laughs> came home and um, waited until he had a chance to just be relaxed and not have to do anything. Sat down in front of CNN and he took uh, three big, four big puffs, he said. And he remembered that he should be feeling something, um, but he wasn't. So after about five minutes, he took um, four more big puffs. And in the last puff, he realized that Wolf Blitzer was coming out of the TV <laughs> and, uh, and um, then he would talk and he'd go back in and the next talking head would come out of the TV and back and forth. Um, but, uh, but this was um, disturbing to him and, um, and he started feeling dizzy and he didn't feel good um, and he uh, tried to listen to some music thinking that that would be nice but it sounded screeching to him and he um, uh, tried to lay down and just go to sleep and thought, well, maybe this will go away, this uncomfortable, um, dizzy uh, sensation. And, and it didn't. He couldn't fall asleep. Um, so he actually sat on the couch all night until the early mornings holding on to the lamp um, next to the couch. And uh, um, finally, he stopped hallucinating. Finally, he could fall asleep. Um, so it was not a pleasant experience for him. And uh, the next day, he sold his stash and his bong. And um, now he actually is participating in a study with me. Um, so this is one of my other patients at Burning Man. I uh, wanted to tell you about Parkinson's. Um, it affects about 1% of people over age 60. And uh, uh, it's characterized by tremor, bradykinesia, um, uh, that slowness, and also stiffness. And it can affect balance, especially in the later stages. Um, but it's actually the non-motor symptoms that are the most problematic and that people have cognitive dysfunction um, that can eventually go lead to dementia in some folks. They have a lot of anxiety and depression and psychosis. And um, they also have a, um, trouble with sleep. They act out their dreams. It's called REM sleep behavior disorder. And they have constipation and other, other autonomic dysfunction. So it's really all those symptoms that impair quality of life. 
Um, about a million people have uh, Parkinson's in the United States, and we have about 15,000 in uh, Colorado. So um, shortly, in a couple of years, a colleague of mine, after it had um, become recreationally available, uh, Benzie Kluger, uh, ran a survey in our clinic to see how many of our Parkinson's folks were actually using um, cannabis, and about 5% of them were, I think it's higher, was higher, um, but uh, they were using a variety of different substances. And they were using it because it was helpful. Um, although this first patient had a bad experience, we had many people that were reporting that it helped with tremor, anxiety, stiffness, um, sleep, um, but we did have that the older folks did not like to get high. Some of the younger folks, yes, but some of the older folks, it just made them dizzy. Um, so I don't need to tell this group about uh, THC, um, but in terms of Parkinson's, there's some things why, why it might be good or might be bad. Um, we, it's known that uh, THC is helpful for nausea, um, that it promotes appetite, um, and that it looks like it's helpful in pain, uh, and there has some evidence that it's helpful for spasticity and multiple sclerosis and for um, uh, epilepsy and Huntington's disease. But it also seems to impair cognition, at least acutely, and um, can cause panic, uh, anxiety, uh, and hallucinations. <coughs> so um, the second, um, the second uh, component of cannabis, uh, CBD, um, is, uh, doesn't seem to cause the high, um, and it might temper the high that is uh, uh, happening with THC. And it also has been thought to be helpful in, in some medical uses, and uh, in particular, um, perhaps as an antipsychotic, and I'll go over some of the rest of it. So in terms of Parkinson's disease, if you were to, um, to study this, uh, then THC might aggravate some of the problems that Parkinson's patients are having already by affecting cognition, increasing anxiety, increasing uh, psychosis, and decreasing balance, whereas the CBD might be helpful in reducing anxiety and, um, and patients with Parkinson's will have hallucinations sometimes just from the medications and having Parkinson's. So uh, maybe the CBD would be helpful in that regard. So, um, but as a neurologist, then I always start out thinking, you know, what are the effects on cognition? Uh, and uh, there are some studies um, that suggest that there are some chronic effects. Certainly there's the acute effects that some people enjoy and um, some people don't. But the chronic effects, um, it, if you add all the literature together, this was a meta-analysis um, from a few years ago, and I think that the most, um, the summary is that if you look really carefully, probably it, there can be some persistent effects on verbal learning and memory, and that that um, is most associated with the frequency of use and the age of onset, so kind of a cumulative life exposure. Um, uh, other uh, meta-analysis studies, um, uh, neuroimaging has shown that there's morphological brain changes, and um, particularly in uh, adolescents and also in adults. And the functional studies suggest that um, there's a change in the resting global <coughs> state and also a change um, in the functional activity during cognitive tasks. When I was getting started in this research, then I looked over the, the literature on what's known in regards to CBD, and um, what we were seeing is that there's a lot of studies that have been done, a lot, um, but uh, that um, the doses uh, and the um, composition of the cannabis varied a lot, um, so the, and the results varied a lot. Some people had good results, some people had no results. Um, but the problem was that there was so much variation in what they were taking. Um, but in general, uh, it looked like that doses up to about 1,500 milligrams of CBD um, um, orally uh, a day um, were well tolerated. So 
Um, there was one randomized controlled uh, study in Parkinson's disease, 21 patients. They divided them into three groups, placebo, 75 milligrams of CBD, and 300 milligrams of CBD. <clears throat> and this didn't have any THC in it. And there was no change in this uh, scale that we call the UPDRS. That is the unified motor, um, the unified Parkinson's disease rating scale. And uh, it, uh, it um, evaluates the, all the different uh, symptoms of Parkinson's, including the motor signs. Um, but these patients did report a significant improvement in the quality of life measure called the PDQ39 at the 300 <coughs> milligrams a day. Um, there was not any change or improvement at the 75, and there were no side effects. Um, there's a lot of other studies that have been done in Parkinson's, but, um, but um, mostly open label, and um, this seemed to be the major one that was helpful. Um, so why might CBD be worth looking at in Parkinson's? Uh, there's a lot of work going on onto the, in terms of the mechanism of CBD, and uh, um, I think that probably in terms of Parkinson's, it might be because of its action on serotonin receptors, um, serotonin uh, 1A and 2A. Um, also, CBD decreases um, the enzyme FAAH, which metabolizes anatomide, and therefore you have more anatomide to work on CB uh, receptors 1 and 2. And maybe that's helpful in Parkinson's. Um, also, um, there's uh, uh, a lot of other receptors, and I don't really understand or know exactly what they're doing. Um, but uh, TRPV1 um, is uh, the an anatomide increases that. CBD has an effect on that. And um, that plus an increase in mitochondrial function and um, the PPAR gamma um, uh, receptor, that is uh, probably a positive thing too. And those different actions can decrease inflammation and um, increase, uh, decrease uh, reactive oxygen species damage. Um, so maybe, maybe CBD is neuroprotective. There's a lot of um, um, basic science uh, and uh, animal studies suggestive of that. And I would love to study that further in a neurodegenerative disease like Parkinson's. Um, but I was able to get funding uh, for a um, efficacy study uh, from the Colorado Department of Public Health, uh, as uh, other people were in um, this room. And that funding would start after um, the IRB, DE, uh, after IRB approval and after <coughs> all the regulatory stuff was in place. Um, after all that was in place, then we, and we were ready to enroll the first patient, we would get some money. So we hypothesized that CBD um, would have a significant effect on reducing tremor and that it would be well tolerated. And we wanted to do this um, via a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial. So the first um, item of business was to get a study drug. And um, in 2015, CBD um, was a Schedule I drug uh, and it has a, um, a Schedule I drug means that it has a high potential for abuse and it has no currently accepted medical use um, and it lacked accepted uh, safety even under medical supervision. That's what a Schedule I drug is. Um, so to do this study, I needed to get um, the CBD from NIDA uh, um, or at least I needed to get it from um, a uh, company that already had approval to use it in the United States for another indication um, because then the FDA would allow me to do the study. Um, so uh, I knew that I wanted to get CBD without very much THC in it, but what dose? Uh, so then I just really had to work from scratch uh, to figure out what dose, but the most solid evidence was that, um, was that uh, GW was studying Epidiolex um, at 20 milligrams per kilogram per day and finding that it was reducing seizures. So that was having a definite CNS effect. So I thought that's a dose that I should use. Well, that was in kids, um, pediatric epilepsy, but I still thought, well, that's what I should aim for. Um, 
So therefore, I couldn't use the NIDA product because it would have too much THC in it and make the patients high if I wanted to use that much CBD. So GW did um, eventually uh, um, uh, supply cannabidiol, uh, and they have a very pure product, uh, less than 1% uh, THC, and it's in sesame oil, 100 milligrams um, per uh, milliliter. Um, so the idea was that I would um, do an open label study. I'd start at five milligrams per kilogram per day and gradually go up to 25 milligrams per kilogram per day. And we would um, see how that affected them and see what dose seemed to be the best and take that on to a randomized controlled study. So um, we uh, uh, wanted to evaluate the safety and tolerability and we wanted to look at the effect on tremor. And I just point out that these are in red because, um, because GW was um, generous to give us their drug, um, but, uh, but they did ask us to change the primary and secondary uh, specific aims because did not want to um, have a failed uh, study, a, a possibility of a failed study. Um, but while we were at it, we were going to look at anxiety, mood, all the other symptoms that Parkinson's patients have. So um, this was, took a lot of regulatory work to get up and going. Um, the university uh, has been wonderful in uh, revamping rooms and um, being very supportive. Um, uh, marijuana wasn't allowed on the campus, um, so a lot of um, regulatory stuff had to happen. Uh, GW, um, University of Co uh, Colorado Denver, and the CDPHE all had to negotiate. Everybody had what they were looking at. Um, uh, SARC, the Scientific Advisory Review Committee, um, took my protocol and turned it into um, a much better protocol with a lot more detail in it um, over a, a lot of time, uh, but it was a learning effort for me. Uh, and Comerb, uh, therefore, had to approve it. and. Then I had to get an IND from the FDA, and I had to get a Schedule One license from the DEA. I had to go through the, um, get everything kosher with the uh, environmental health and safety uh, there on um, the university, and I needed to um, do other stuff. Um, and the parts in yellow are what is specific to marijuana research, but a lot of it is, you know, just investigator-initiated studies um, take a lot of work. So um, in my case, most of the work was getting a study drug. Uh, that took uh, 22 months and um, no support until we were ready to enroll the first patient. So, um, so we enrolled 15 patients, um, one w uh, withdrawal, one screen failure. We had 13 patients um, start the study drug. Uh, three dropped out due to side effects. And so we had 10 patients left to look at efficacy um, in this open label study and we had all patients that took the study drug were in the safety group to be analyzed. So um, the average age of the patients was 68, and they were mostly male, and they um, were mostly in the early middle, early to early middle stages of Parkinson's. Um, the number one side effect was diarrhea. 84% uh, of people, almost 70% had somnolence um, and fatigue. Uh, was common and other side effects shown here. So um, there were uh, quite a few side effects. This graph is to show the side effects at each dose. And so if you look at the gray bars, then um, the, they're the only ones that are increasing with each dose. That's diarrhea. And I think that was because of the oil. Um, patients were taking 10 to 15 milliliters of oil a day. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, so, but the side effects, although there were a high number of them, were mostly mild and tolerated. Um, three did drop out due to um, abdominal pain, rash, and one of them hepatitis. Um, we, the liver uh, function, about a third of the patients had an in, a bump in their liver enzymes, and it was in a cholestatic pattern. So this pattern um, was. Uh, um, not the usual hepatocellular pattern and can be associated with a, a fatal disorder called um, uh, the, um, called the, uh, uh, what is it called? Um, the ducts diminishing or um, the, the ducts of the, um, are 
uh, dying off. And it's fatal. You need a, it's associated with some drugs and you would need a liver transplant. So we didn't, you know, this was kind of scary. Um, um, and uh, uh, talk more about that. But we did see some improvement in motor signs. Again, this is open label. Um, and we saw improvement in nighttime sleep and in emotional behavioral discontrol scale, which was like aggression, agitation. Um, and uh, so in conclusion, from that open label study, it looked like there were some mild effects, but uh, side effects and some mild benefit, but there was this cholestatic liver changes that we were concerned about. Um, so we wanted to go on, though, to the next, uh, to the randomized controlled study. But um, because of the liver problems, then uh, GW um, withdrew um, the Epidiolex. Uh, and so I had to start all over again, and I had a funding deadline. Um, so where to get the CBD? So back to the NIDA, back to the um, pharmaceutical companies that were already making various forms of CBD. And it turned out that the pharmaceutical companies were not, um, nothing was available through that route. Uh, but NIDA had an extract that they could give me some of. And it was now 30 to 1 uh, CBD to THC. So that was much more reasonable than they had my first time around in keeping the THC dose low. Um, but they only had a limited amount that they could give me. And um, I had to make sure not make the patients high, um, so I could only give the patients um, so much. Uh, and um, so because they could only, um, because they, so to not make the patients high, I had to reduce the dose to just 100 to 200 milligrams a day. And um, because, uh, because I had the limited amount, then I could only have them on it for so long. Um, and. Uh, because they were not able to give me a matched placebo, I had to make a placebo, and therefore it wasn't perfect, and so therefore I had to change it from a crossover to a parallel study so the patients could stay blinded. And that meant I had to increase the number of patients, but still I have a limited supply of drug, so the patients could, <laughs> <laughs> the patients could only be on the um, study drug for like 10 to, 15, uh, 10 to 15 days. Um, which was enough for them to, uh, to experience it adequately. But, um, so this extract was a thick black goo, and thank goodness for my um, pharmacy uh, colleagues um, that uh, they helped me um, turn it into something the patients could take and, um, that, uh, and help me make a placebo. So it ended up to be a 100 milligram per milliliter CBD in sesame oil, but the patients would only take, in this case, uh, um, about one and a fourth milliliter twice a day, which would give them um, about 4.2 milligrams of THC orally a day. Um, so hopefully that they would not get high. So this is my patient with the um, study drug. And uh, so just to recap, um, Briefly, uh, we got funding. It, uh, we were able to get this study started after 22 months. It took us about eight months to do the open label study. Then it took us another 18 months after we found out we couldn't have Epidiolex. Um, and uh, we started the uh, randomized control uh, trial in September at our first patient. And we were able to get a no cost extension. Um, and so, uh, the couple of um, bugaboos in this, besides what I've already told you, um, the uh, FDA came back and said that the patients couldn't drive. Our IRB said they could, but the FDA said no. So now we have patients that are uh, no longer, um, it's a parallel study, so they no longer can be assured to get the CBD, and they're told they can't drive. So uh, harder recruitment. Um, and uh, so I offered Uber. Uh, lift and um, they uh, the, this population actually doesn't do that <laughs> they, they weren't excited about that and they weren't buying into it although it added about 30,000 to the budget um, also uh, with this new product I had to figure out how to do stability testing and that took several months um, and also one of my colleagues but had a surprise audit uh, and uh, so I had to find a monitor, um, which was a good thing, and um, that was more money too. So just a lot of, uh, of stuff. 
So, but we finally did get started, and um, the uh, aim is to look at motor symptoms uh, and safety and tolerability and everything. So we have enrolled 11 patients so far. Um, two screen failed and uh, two have completed. One of them um, had some significant side effects, uh, so we reduced her dose to like a fourth of that, and she did well and felt good on it. She liked, um, she felt like uh, she was being helped with sleep, and she was relaxed. And uh, um, we've had a challenge with the blinding. Um, that the the uh, <laughs> the patient, we put the patient in the special room. To, they would take the drug in clinic for the first time, so we could make sure they were okay. So we put them in a special vented room, and we'd send in somebody that wasn't part of the study um, to administer the drug, a PA. Um, and uh, because the, the um, study drug versus the placebo, the study drug has a strong terpene smell. And so we would have the room well vented, and the patient <laughs> would have to sit in there for 10 minutes because that's what the study showed would take out the smell. And then somebody else could go in after that. Um, so. Um, it, that has been challenging. Also, we put um, in the placebo, we put in black uh, um, uh, food coloring, and one of the patients in the hallway is saying, you know, I can't get this black stuff off my fingers. And the other patient's going into the vented room and going, I, I hope that I don't have that problem. And I didn't have that problem, actually, so I wonder. <laughs> 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 so anyway, it's been challenging for everybody to stay blinded, but we've each, each problem we've we've worked on a way to solve it um, and I think have solved it but uh, so a lot of challenges I would just say that the number one problem with doing this research is having a study drug and uh, so actually NIDA um, is very interested in hearing from all of us as to what we want um, and they will grow it uh, they're going to do an, uh, grow in start to grow in March of 2019 um, and uh, maybe uh, the political climate will change and other companies actually can get approval from the DEA to be um, providing their good products. Um, so, uh, the, you know, it's a lot of work to do research and it's just more work with marijuana. Um, if it wasn't for the political climate, it would be a lot easier. Um, so there's um, some future directions in terms of I would like to uh, eventually study CBD in uh, slowing the progression of Parkinson's and other neurodegenerative disorders. Um, and uh, this is again at Burning Man. <laughs> Thank you all.